So this event is brought to you by Data Talks Club, which is a, a community of people who love talking about data. And we have weekly events. And today is uh, one of such events. Um, typically, we have two types of events. And you can find more about these events if you go to our website, datatalks.club slash events. And uh, so yeah, we here we have uh, two types of events. Uh, today we have a live podcast event where we talk about uh, different topics. So today we will talk about data ops. Um, and you can see here that uh, next week we'll talk about online communities and then we'll talk about transitioning from project, project management to data science. And then on uh, Tuesdays we have uh, um, presentations like uh, call them webinars, um, more technical events with slides. So if you want to find out more, go to our website. And uh, yeah, so to stay up to date about our events, the first thing you can do is you can subscribe to our newsletter. Then of course you can um, also join our Slack if you haven't yet. And the last thing what you can do is you can just subscribe on YouTube and every time we have a stream, you will get a notification. And the last thing uh, that uh, during our chat today with Lars, you can ask any question. And for that, you should use a pinned link in the chat, in live chat. So it's there, just go there, click on this and ask any question you want. Um, you can ask questions anonymously, uh, but you can also put your name there. And then, yeah, we can just uh, refer to you uh, by name when um, asking questions. And uh, that's all for the introduction. So now just let me quickly get my notes. And uh, yeah, let's start. Are you ready to start? Absolutely. Do you want to share your screen or, oh, sorry, not screen, but uh, camera or? Oh, I thought it was on, uh, sorry. I go? can only see your. Oh, you're, you're right, it turned off. So. Am I visible now? No. No, it's uh, all black. Oh. Ah, bummer. Okay. There we go. Yes. Ah, you have quite a few books there. Uh, yeah, that's mostly my wife's, <laughs> actually. <laughs> okay. So let's start. Okay. So this week we will talk about data ops. And what is this and how is it different from any other something something ops uh, that we have out there? So we have a special guest today, Lars. And uh, Lars is the founder of, uh, let me try to pronounce it and then please correct me. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a difficult word. It's, uh, Lars is the founder of Sklink. Yes, correct, correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, which is a data engineering startup based in Stockholm. So Lars frequently speaks on data related topics and we tried to get him on this podcast to talk about data ops and luckily he agreed so welcome lars thanks for joining us today thank you it's a pleasure to be here yes so before we go uh, into our main topic of data ops let's start with your background can you briefly tell us about your career journey so far Yes, uh, I'll try to not uh, <laughs> delve for too long. <laughs> so I, I graduated uh, from the Royal Institute of Technology uh, in 97, I think it was. And uh, I was an academic for a long time uh, into re uh, distributed systems. And uh, when distributed systems uh, became popular in industry, uh, I got a call from a Google recruiter. So I joined Google in 2007. And... Um, as one of the first uh, engineers in Stockholm, and uh, we built uh, Google's first generation of video conferencing sy systems. And uh, that was a uh, sort of a milestone in my career because it gave a glimpse into the future. Uh, Google was the only company uh, in 2007 to do what we, we today call big data. Uh, and uh, it uh, immediately became uh, sort of apparent to me how much value you could extract from your data if you if you had the skills and the, and the infrastructure and the competence. So ever since my uh, sort of career gravitated towards data, uh, at Google, I was working in engineering pro productivity as well. And we, we did some uh, productivity improvements that are still 
uh, beyond what is sort of state of, of practice in, in most companies. So that those two things have essentially colored my career, a, a uh, focus on efficiency uh, and obsession on efficiency and, and, and then on data. So fast forward a couple of years, I managed to join uh, Spotify here, here in Stockholm uh, when I realized they were doing interesting things and had a Hadoop cluster and so forth. Um, so I was uh, part of a sort of the core data infrastructure team, and uh, we did back in 2013 a transformation to what today has the name of, of data ops, but we didn't yet have a name at the time. Um, and uh, fast forward again a couple of years, I've been freelancing uh, first for a number of years, uh, trying to sort of spread the, the superpowers of, of data and machine learning and AI to, uh, to other companies outside the, the little tech elite that, it, that currently are, are running ahead of everybody else. And uh, I, I did that as a uh, as sort of a self-employed consultant for a while. I you know, embedded into companies, everything from from like star, big banks to startups to re, to retail to to news, so forth. Um, but I was ultimately limited in how there's only so much that you can do to change these companies. And usually, I go in there and I try, try to build technology, but usually not technology is not the limiting factor. Uh, so so therefore, I. I been sort of very limited in in uh, what I could achieve as a loan consultant. So um, a couple of years ago, we, we flipped this around and say, okay, uh, it's the key is the the ways of working and, and the workflows and how you work with data, not not the technology. Uh, so uh, so we're now trying out a, a sort of different collaboration paradigm where. We say you have data uh, to our customers, right? You have data that has potential, that has value. So, how about we, together with you, figure out what the value is in this data and try to extract value from it through through uh, th simple things like reporting and analytics, or, or all the way to machine learning. And but we do it, right? So we together with you because you are the domain experts. But but we handle the how we work, uh, the technology stack, and the operations and, and so forth and thereby sort of circumvent the need to change how, how our customers work and, and instead extract the value from the data and then returning valuable data or data assets to customers. Mm -hmm. So you've been self-employed self for five, six years? Or I am um, four, something like that. I don't know. Okay. Uh, and, and you said like you started with data ops even before it became, I think, in 2013, right? Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, how, how, how was it called there? Or like, uh, how did you, like, what was that? Or what was <laughs> what that happened? For you? <laughs> yes. Like, how did you, how did you come up with uh, this? So uh, I mean, we didn't we didn't give it a name. It was it got the name got coined the year after by someone from IBM, I believe, uh, and then it got, became a thing like uh, 2018 or, or 2017, 2018 or something. But uh, roll back to 2013. Um, we were there were just a few teams that were intensively working with data at Spotify at the time. So. Um, and and I was in sort of the the core team, and we were doing both the the infrastructure and the platform, uh, but also handling some of the main pipelines, like uh, the you know, what songs have been played and what uses do we have, uh, and so forth. And then there were there were a couple of power user teams as well, like recommendations, for example. Uh, but we were getting swamped with requests for, from analytics and from from various other sources. Hey, can you implement this X, Y, and Z for us? So we were in in a way, an, an internal consultant team as, as well. And uh, this was no longer feasible, the, the, that everybody was uh, dissatisfied with us having so little bandwidth. So uh, in a uh, sort of a Spotify manner, we said, well, the team should be autonomous, right? There's a very autonomous uh, culture at Spotify. So we should enable them instead from, be, from being dependent on us. So. Uh, we we sort of flipped that uh, situation around and said, uh, okay, let's let's build the tooling and the workflows to support everybody to go in and uh, build their own data flows uh, on the on the data platform, the Hadoop based uh, data platform that we had. So um, 
the goal was to enable everyone to be able to deploy a pipeline in production in, in like less than a day and then fix man the pipelines and uh, if there was a problem in less than an hour. And uh, it took us a few months to get the, everything in place. And uh, we uh, embedded one of the factors of success, I believe, is that we embedded with the teams that were the early adopters and actually worked really, very tightly with them to and figure out where we were missing things and so forth. And uh, shortly thereafter, the this sort of the use of pi data pipeline spread throughout the company and the, uh, the Hadoop cluster exploded in size. And, uh, and nowadays they are uh, producing like hundreds of thousands of, of new data sets per day and, and really building data pipelines and using data is, is an obvious thing for every developer team in the company. Mm -hmm. So was it around the time when Luigi appeared? Or was it yeah, Luigi dates of, uh... back to 2010, 2011 and so forth. That, 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 okay. that was our, our workhorse uh, at the time and still is uh, at Spotify. Uh, so we can go back, come back to Luigi later uh, in, the, <laughs> in the episode, I think. Yes. But what I heard is like you had a date, uh, like uh, you were working in uh, like the, on a data platform, but you were swamped with requests. So everybody wanted you to implement something. And what you did instead, you kind of reverted it and let other teams, like you kind of created like a self-service platform, right? So they could implement uh, whatever they needed, whatever data transformation things they want to do. So you enabled them to implement that and you focused on on building this self-service uh, thing so others could move faster without your, um, uh, well, without your, uh, you know, you implementing things, right? Exactly. exactly. And is it like the, this is the, like, is this why you said this is like core of data ops or like what is data ops? Well, what is data ops? That, that's a good question. Well, uh, you can look at it from a few angles, right? One is the uh, the enablement, which, which was the angle that I brought up now, enable everybody to be uh, sort of self-sufficient. And it's, there's a parallel here to, de to DevOps, right? Is Instead of having, having developers throw things over the wall to operations, you, you integrate the, the activities so that people are enabled to run their own things. Um, there, there is also the workflows and the tooling with, with continuous, we built continuous deployment at the time. And I, I believe that was one of the first continuous deployments uh, at scale in Europe, at least for, on, on a data platform like this. Um, and, but I would like to sort of highlight another aspect and that's the people aspect. Uh, because if you take a, a sort of a, if I can go out on the tangent here, do a more like philosophical and historical uh, view on this. It, if you look back for 50 years from now, the, the, the waterfall paper came out by, by Winston Royce. And he said, he looked at software engineering and he said, this is what seems to be happening. He just like observed right? and said that there seems to be phases of requirements, then design, then uh, coding, then testing, then, then, uh, and then deployment or operations. Right? And these, these are done by different people, but, and they're done in that order. Uh, and this doesn't seem, the, this was made sense from a civil engineering point of view, but he said it doesn't seem to make sense from a software engineering point of view. Uh, and, but people disregarded the, his comments uh, and say, oh yes, that's how we do it. We now have a methodology and let's call that waterfall, right? Uh, and that was dominant um, for, for a long time. And eventually uh, sort of extreme programming popped up and, and said, well, it doesn't seem to be efficient this. Let's, how about we mix the activities of development and, and quality assurance and do that in this integrated with the, to these mix two different these two different skills and different people working together towards the same goal instead of of having different goals with the developers throwing something over the wall and the quality assurance trying to prevent the developers from from doing bad things right it, it, with contradictory uh, like goals and alignment so instead we set these people together and have the same alignment and nowadays that's obvious right that that's much more efficient and that those that those types of transformations have, have appeared ever since. The agile is, is not a type of such transformation where you take the design and the requirements and you model that up with, with development so that it becomes iterative and you same people do it and try to figure out what the requirements are along the path. And 
data ops is yet another of those uh, of, of that evolution of mixing up different types of people and different types of competences. So not only development and quality assurance and operations, uh, but also uh, data modeling and data skills and analytics into the same melting pot and all aligned towards the same goal. Uh, and and that I believe is the key, right? When, when you when you're all aligned, and, we, and they, this has, this alignment has become obvious for for a QA. They used to be a blocking thing, and operations used to be a blocking thing that said no. And if we look at the the disciplines that still have this blocking thing, like security, for example, where, where you have lots of people that say no. Uh, and see this as their their goal in in life or, or in the company. Uh, there's still so much friction, right? So so data ops is a way to to like remove that friction and get people aligned towards the same goal. And I I think that's the important part. The, it's the people part. So mm -hmm. is the people. Okay. So the first one is enable enablement. So you enable others to to do self service and uh, build data pipelines. Then the well, actual data pipelines so that you have this workflow component, right? So you can um, design, like build the workflow, like when one thing depends on the other, uh, you can have that. And then the final, and uh, you mentioned this is like the most important one, is the people component where everyone works together on the same goal, right? It's not like a waterfall where you uh, throw something over the wall and hope they will take care of everything, but instead you work together in one team uh developers analytics uh, analysts uh, data engineers uh, everyone work together together on achieving the same goal right so this yeah, is the exactly there, there is a key uh sort of technical or process component here that needs to be in place in order to do the enablement and that is to switch from uh from the traditional database oriented mutable uh, data storages. Uh, so if you look back in time, we, we used to have databases right? and everything was, 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 all the data that we had was in databases. And in, in databases, you have like uh, mutable records where you can just, you know, I can go in and change your address, for example. And we also have uh, mutable collections of, 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 of records. So every day the, the user list is different. Right? Um, and that only scales to a certain degree. We all know the limitations of, of, of the monolith, right? And because too many people cannot go in there and same at the same time, so you have you have few teams that are uh, are able to to work in there. So we have the microservices split where where everybody has their own. All the teams have their own database, but that's spread out all the data. So we cannot use data easily from one end of the company to another. And the solution here has been and now we're, we're getting into the, what you mentioned before a data platform uh, and uh, to gather all of the data that you have within the company into a data platform and that's 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 a key uh, key sort of technology or or a, a workflow uh, component that you need to get in place and um, one imp and the in inside the data platform you have a couple of principles in order for to make it work at at scale and when i say scale i don't necessarily mean data scale in, in into from terabytes to petabytes but a human scale from one team to 10 teams to 100 teams and also to scale in terms of business logic complexity that you can do more and more complex things and achieve more things uh, and the, the the key sort of the key principles for for achieving this scale is essentially what can be described as functional architectural principles. So you take the principles for functional programming and apply them on an architectural level. So you have, for example, all the data you should in, put in there should be immutable. You you strive to make it immutable as much as you can, uh, because immutable things you can freely share. If I dump a data set in a file and say, here's the data set, it will never change. Then I don't need to coordinate with the other teams that might use it, right? But in order to uh, do something intelligent with it, I need to process it. But I can't, since I can't mutate it, I need to transform it into a new data set. So we, instead of mutating things in, in uh, databases with, with SQL queries, we ended up with these pipelines of steps of transformations 
uh, on I immutable data sets and, and purely functional transformations without any uh, external input and, and so forth. Um, and these these functional principles are critical to to making the uh, the sort of making data processing and, and extracting value from data scale to large to large volumes of value basically. So this is like the this data platform is the key um, how to say technology enabler like for an organization to uh, you know to implement this data ops right so because we need to we need we need this tool to uh like you said to scale in terms of people uh to be able to process all the data we have and you mentioned one thing like this immutability and this brings to, to mind like uh i just had a chat today um about like about etl processes like when you have some data and you want transform uh, this data into a certain um, like to a sequence of steps to transform it and then, and the problem we were talking about uh, somebody in chat uh, with Ankush, um, that when you run this data on different, uh, like let's say you can run it at six o'clock or twelve o'clock, right? And uh, the problem is when you run it and the results are different, right? So this is because of your data is not immutable, right? So you can change your roles, you can change your database, right? And then uh, when you run this uh, ETL process at different times results is different right and this is what data platform tries to to solve uh with uh, this immutability right yeah exactly and, and the, the situation that you describe uh that was the case in the sort of the data warehouse days when you would do these things for for reporting purposes and so for in data warehouses uh, because they were the each of the data sets will represent as mutable data tables and as new data was arriving they would change a bit so you could not reproduce the steps so uh so we uh in a sort of a a purely built so to speak data platform with with a, these data pipelines and data factories uh then then you have in theory full uh, reproducibility uh but then we have other ways to handle late incoming data for example uh and it we're still the world is still in uh, training on this one mm -hmm. uh because the it's very easy to fall back into the old mutable practices and we actively see some of the main actors in in, in the scene uh mm -hmm sort of falling back there. Uh, for example, we've seen uh, Databricks is, uh, has pushed something called the lake house with, with mutable, where you can mutate data sets. And, and uh, you can look at this from, from different angles. I, so so I, I sometimes say that this is an anti-pattern. This is something that you really should avoid. On the other hand, you can see it as a gateway drug to, to those that have the existing ETL flows in their data warehouse that they can now easily move without changing their workflows to a to a sort of a data lake and and not have to do the redo uh, the the logic and, and the workflow logic to handle immutability. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can take a step back and uh, um, like we talked about this data platform, but what is the data lake? Yes, and how uh, these so, two are related. <laughs> exactly. So, so uh, a data lake is uh, one of my clients. When I described what it is, uh, so one of my clients said, "So this buzzword that everybody keeps talking about is basically just a big disk." And I said, "Yes, <laughs> sorry to disappoint you, but it is a big disk, right? It's just a bunch of files." Uh, and uh, they became popular when Hadoop came out because then it was certainly suddenly economically feasible to to store all all raw data from your web applications and so forth uh, forever uh, but you could do it you know with with older nfs server technology or whatever uh, so it's just a big file system that is shared between the the nodes that do the data mm -hmm. processing so hdfs or um, these days maybe like this uh cloud-based uh, storages like uh, i don't know s3 or uh, google storage or something like this exactly yes mm -hmm. uh, now now in now hadoop is is sort of obsolete and mm -hmm. uh now so nowadays you would use uh, object stores on, mm -hmm. on in the cloud instead mm -hmm. so basically every data you have you dump it to s3 and you just call it a data lake or yes uh in from from <laughs> from a glance yes uh but then you need to 
this will uh, degenerate in what's called a data swamp and if you do uh -huh, it okay. without a, without any a control or governance or order so in order to get value from it you need to have structure in there and also in order to be compliant you need to have some kind of, of, of governance so uh the you uh, part of sort of the, this this big data and data platform uh, uh, philosophy is that you store raw data. You you store the data that has been generated in source systems. You know by by events in mobile apps or, or clicks on your web page or or uh, dumps of your current database, uh, current user database, and so forth. You store those in raw format without processing them whatsoever in, in your data lake and uh, in uh, what I usually call the cold pond. So pond is the, the lingo for, for parts of the data lake. And uh, if, the, if it's not personal data, you store that forever. Uh, if it is personal data, you you have to separate first and, and uh, sort of uh, separate the personal from the non-personal data, so that you can discard the personal data in order to be compliant with GDPR. Mm -hmm. so you uh, have this data lake, right? And then a data platform is like a tool that enables us to process the data in data lake. Because you said, uh, like in essence, we have this, like we have this part of the data lake that is raw data, right? But uh, for an analyst, maybe the raw data is not super useful, right? So they need to be able to transform it, uh, aggregate and whatnot. And this is where a data platform comes into place, right? So this is like enablement for... Uh, exactly. So so the data platform is, is a wider thing that consists of a lake uh, and also of processing capabilities. Uh, and the uh, from a value perspective, the, the primary processing capability is, is, is batch processing. Uh, and... So, and and then you can it, it enables you to build uh, like series of of batch processes that take one data set at a time or or several and combine them and so forth and in refi do refinements from you know usually there's a series of 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 steps where the first ones are cleaning you remove the invalid records you you uh, fix whatever what you know is broken and then you you sort of decorate the record so if you at spotify for example we had uh, songs that have been played and then we join with the users so that we know what what product they were on what country they're in and so forth um and then uh, the these uh, sort of pipelines fan out so the these popular data sets are used for many purposes for reporting purposes for recommendation purposes and so forth and then step by step for each use case you have a series of, of, of uh, refinement steps where you do more and more first the domain and application specific things and then the end the sort of uh, use case specific uh, transformation step by step and uh, at the end of, of such a pipeline you ha have arrived you arrive with some kind of refined data set like a recommendation index for example of, of high value based Build from the raw things of, of low value, and then you take this high value data uh, data set and you export it or egress it to some kind of storage where that is more suitable for serving like a, a SQL or a NoSQL database, mm -hmm. uh, and, that, and then it goes out of the mm -hmm. data platform. And ingress is uh, just what does it exactly mean? Now? Like so ingress is the is the processing of taking things into to the platform and egress is the process of, of taking things out of the platform okay. so the platform itself is completely offline right so it doesn't have any direct connections to to the online world mm -hmm. and that's important uh, because when you're in offline you can move with uh, you can accept higher risk basically so, so you can move with higher speed and with very little operational overhead. So you don't need any staging environments or, or development environments. You can you can do your tests in production and so forth. And that speed translates to innovation capability, basically. And uh, this is what enables other teams to to do the self service. So they can just an analyst who is not necessarily like a, I don't know Hadoop expert can just go there, write SQL queries, and then they get translated to uh, I don't know like maybe internally use Presto or Hive or whatever. And so they just focus on SQL, right? And then the the, the platform takes care of actually executing this and having the data in the form they need. So they don't care. They don't need to care about all these things like I don't know staging and uh, like all these things you mentioned, right? 
So, something like that, yes. Uh, uh, the uh, data platforms are usually uh, fairly sort of technical. So, so you need uh, it, for a team to work directly with the platform, you need a software engineering expertise, mm -hmm. uh, and then. Uh, to, depending on the on the maturity and the size of, of, of the company, you might have have like self serve uh, analytics uh, capabilities for for mm -hmm. uh, uh, analysts to develop things right away, or you could, or you combine the analysts with with engineering expertise. Mm -hmm. And then there is also usually some kind of of data warehouse or data marts in a warehouse at sort of a corner of of the platform where where they primary serves the purpose of exploratory uh, mm -hmm. analytics yeah so you touched a bit like on maturity level this is something uh we i think we definitely should cover a bit later but first maybe we can uh, a bit summarize like this uh what this data platform is so what i understood is data platform like the main parts of that is uh, the data lake that stores uh, the data, especially this raw data, and everything is immutable. The only way we can process something is by creating these uh, transformation steps. And this is what we, um, how to say, orchestrate. Like this is what we create with this uh, processing component, like workflows, right? So we have these two, like the data lake and the, the workflow engine. Is there something else that we need to have in the platform? So now you get to the to the workflow engine here. Um, there is very very little technology that you actually need to have. Like right? you need storage for for, for the lake, uh, but that's just files. That's simple. And uh, when when you egress it at some point, you need uh, some kind of database storage that is indexed as, as well. But you, for most use cases, relational databases are fine. Uh, then you need compute. Uh, so you, you need uh, some way to do perform these transformations. And uh, there are scalable. Uh, uh, things like Spark and Flink and so forth here, but uh, for for most uh, for for most companies, uh, the horizontal scalability is actually not not necessary. You can you can get twelve terabyte memory machines in in the cloud these days, and most people's data sets fit fit in one machine nowadays. Uh, but these tools tend to have languages or DSLs, domain-specific languages that are highly suitable for data processing. So it's easier to take uh, something like Spark or Flink and express your data processing in that language as opposed to uh, chopping up your own Java uh, solution mm -hmm. and do for loops. Right? Um, but the only the only component that's really unique here and, and that you need to solve one way or another is uh, the workflow engine or the work rather the workflow orchestrator uh, and that is it's a simple piece of technology but it's crucial because it keeps you sane and it it makes you weld a, a robust system from fragile components so uh, what it does is that it um, it looks you define a your dependencies between all of your transformations in this workflow orchestrator. Uh, so you say that you know for for this particular recommendation now uh, we need the raw events on the web shop and we need the information about the users dumped on this particular day and, and so forth, and uh, it then. No, it, you don't tell it what the different processing steps are. You don't do processing inside the orchestration engine. You, you rather do that in, in your Spark jobs or whatever on the outside. Uh, and then you schedule this to run every once in a while uh, when new data arrives or, or every hour or so. And it tries. And if it fails, it will later try again, which means that if the data is late or, or if you have a pr transient problem or, or if you have a bug, uh, the workflow engine will try and to, sort of repair. So it's like a build system for, for but for data, and uh, that's one of the keys of, of data success at Spotify is that we nail this uh, with Luigi. Basically, the, we used to have uh, Uzi that is shipped with with Hadoop, and uh, and that's a terrible thing. And then we made something 
something else that was called a builder and then we made a builder 2 and then we made rambo or if it was in some other order <laughs> and finally <laughs> we made luigi uh, based on the learnings that we have made and sort of got this right and and that what that's what kept us sane and kept us able to to do these things at a, at a very large scale uh, but luigi is a very very simple tool it's it ha has very little complexity uh, and it's it's easy to to adapt uh, but it, you need to get this welding in place mm -hmm. that it, this is so only applies to batch uh, processing which i tend to focus on nowadays stream processing is very uh, po popular as well and uh, many data platforms has a, has a stream processing capabilities usually built around kafka or, or some similar tool um, the, there are pros and cons with batch and stream, uh, but, but uh, I, there's, streaming is very fashionable these days, but comes at a significantly higher cost of operations. So it's because it doesn't have this workflow orchestration that sort of automatically repairs and heals the system, you need to keep things up. And if things go down, you, you need to do mm -hmm. much, many, much more operations. So I, I tend to gravitate towards batch, because the the time that I don't have to spend on operations, I can spend on innovation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, what if we want to? So, you mentioned Luigi. I know there are other tools. Maybe. Um, so, well, let me take a step back. So, you mentioned that, uh, like, for a data platform, we have uh, three components: we have the storage, we have compute, and we have this workflow engine, right? So, if we want to implement a data lake. Uh, data platform, sorry. So I, I guess there are, first of all, there are probably data platforms that just work out of the box. You just buy them and you have it, right? Uh, yes and yes and no. Uh, usually people go to the cloud for these things and then uh -huh. they just pick the pieces. But they, I mean, these, all of these uh, components are just technically so simple that you can, uh, it's easy to put them together. Uh, you can get some help. Uh, the, if you go to the cloud, there, there, there are, the different vendors have different mm -hmm. sort of prepackaged things. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, the ones, several of them are not particularly good, to be honest. Uh, and but then there are uh, there are so there are a few so, that are sort of useful. So if you instead of Luigi use Airflow as your workflow mm -hmm. orchestrator, it comes with more things. It has mm -hmm. a wider scope. And it it's more opinionated, which uh, if you're a power user like me, that becomes annoying because there are some things that it can't do. It, it, but but for beginners, that's usually a a good thing because it sort of pushes you towards some reasonable patterns. Uh, so and but there are no. Um, there are no fully prepackaged data platforms that I, I would recommend. But on mm -hmm. the other hand, uh, once you obtain the skills there, it's technically easy to put together. Mm -hmm. So for example, if we talk about clouds, uh, then for storage, we have this uh, object storage, right? And uh, I don't know, S3 or Google, uh, Google storage, right? Then for compute, the, like all these, uh, uh, all these clouds, all the major cloud providers, they have their own tools. Um, I guess like maybe for, Google Cloud, this is like BigQuery, can be one of these things, right? Uh, yeah, BigQuery is, is essentially a data warehouse. If, okay. so, so, but you, yes, you can run jobs in, in BigQuery mm -hmm. as well. Um, so the, uh, for compute, uh, I mean, the, the plain virtual machines work fine. Nowadays, everything is containerized. So then a, one of the managed Kubernetes clusters is, mm -hmm. is perfectly fine or, or things like uh, Fargate or, or GK mm -hmm. Autopilot where you just okay. run a container. Uh, that's, that's perfectly fine as well. You just need to be able to run a, a batch mm -hmm. or, or a cron job, yes. basically. So, and if you can then express your job in terms of SQL, then you can use BigQuery or I don't know, the equivalent in AWS, Athena, right? But uh, like then uh, you maybe lose some flexibility. Uh, also, exactly. I, I think most of the clouds have like managed Spark that you can just also, yeah. just, you can use, uh, um, okay. Yeah, more or less clear. And then for workflow orchestration, we have Luigi Airflow. Um, and I know now that we have uh, more and more such tools that uh, maybe do not uh, that are not written in Python like uh, Luigi and uh, Airflow, but uh, 
they've got like this YAML syntax maybe. Uh, I don't know, do you, have you used any of them? I, I am aware of Dagster and Prefect, I think it's the name. I think they're both in Python. Uh, nowadays, fortunately, we've left the days of uh, UC XML uh, workflow orchestration. And nowadays, since peop people yeah, tend to want to target uh, data scientists as well, Python is, is sort of the natural okay. choice. Um, okay. Yeah. So we already have a couple of questions. So the first one is uh, regarding uh, functional programming principles applied to architecture. Is there any good literature that you can recommend on building these functional architectures? Um, so I, well, uh, there are a couple of tangential books. I think the original, the original good book that described these functional transforms is Nathan Mars, uh, who made Storm uh, once upon a time. Uh, he wrote a book called Big Data back in 2012, 2013, something. And that defined that that's the definition of the Lambda architecture. Uh, Lambda architecture is nowadays, it actually has two parts. Nowadays, just one is remembered, and that's the uh, that's the part where you have dual streaming and batch pipelines and combine them. Uh, but the other part is more important, and that's where he that's where what I explained earlier with this you, you know, you save the raw data sets and then you do these transformations. Uh, and that was uh, sort of formulated in in the in this book and in a blog post blog post at the same time. Uh, there's a more fresh book uh, by Harwinder Atwal, I think I got his name right, which is plainly called DateOps, I believe, or DateOps in mm -hmm. Practice or something like that. Uh, but that's a, that has a, a much wider scope uh, and is not uh, so focused on, on these functional transforms. And then the third resource that I want to throw out is uh, that uh, we have a data engineering reading list on skling.com slash reading list uh, with lots of links to books, presentations, uh, YouTube videos, uh, and so forth. And so you'll find information. I, I remember going through this and uh, actually to prepare to this uh, to this talk is where I do inspirations <laughs> from from that. Uh, so thanks a lot for putting this together. I will make sure to include the link in the description. Um, so then we have another. Uh, so you already touched a bit uh, batch versus streaming. Um, we have a question related to that. Um, so. Um, as far as batch versus streaming go, what are your thoughts on data latency? And how frequent is too frequent uh, well, for batch jobs? Yes, uh, that's a good question because that's a trade-off, right? Uh, with batch, you uh, with streaming, you can sort of process it more or less right away, uh, or or uh, at, actually, let's let's split it into three time windows here, right? If and, and we're now talking about the latency from new interesting data coming in to you reacting on it. Your process is reacting on it and serving something back to the user. Uh, and the, the shortest latency is when you have direct interaction and, and then you have a user that expects something within on the order of hundreds, uh, 100 milliseconds and so forth. Streaming is too slow for that, essentially. So th then it has to be in memory in your server in order to, to get the, have this uh, completely interactive experience. Um, and then you have batch where where things are can be really slow, like re reporting or you you're making a human uh, analytics or business insights decision is to be made. Then, then you can wait for an hour and that's fine, right? <clears throat> and then you have streaming sort of takes care of the window in between. And then the question is how how big is that window because. It, you can't get it to, down to tens or, or hundreds of milliseconds because streaming involves hops between multiple machines and also some batching in some internal batching in order to make it efficient. Uh, and there are cases where, where that uh, that might be interesting. For example, fraud detection is one typical example where you, in a few seconds, it would be great if you figured out that this credit transaction was was fraudulent. 
example. Uh, <clears throat> that cannot go down to a few seconds, but it can easily go down to a couple of minutes. I've been running uh, batch processes with like one, two minute latencies. And um, I think that we can actually, with the current technology, squeeze the batch latency down to tens 10 seconds, perhaps. I've never had really had the use. So, which means that the window where you really need to do streaming is kind of small. And, uh, and uh, you, there are few use cases in that particular window. Uh, so, I, instead of developing stream complex streaming technology what we try to do is push the latency of batch instead because then you have this workflow orchestration and the very forgiving environment where you, where you can operate with and ha accept high risk but be able to recover nevertheless mm -hmm. i don't know if that answered the question yeah, um, i think it does and then we have a related question in your opinion what is the boundary between micro batching and streaming uh <clears throat> the uh the importance boundary here is is not what the technology does, right? For example, if you go to Spark streaming, they have this micro batching thing. But from a programmer perspective, it's a streaming experience. Uh, whereas if you go to batch and and in and your you have the workflow orchestration where you as a programmer explicitly say that this minute of events is one batch or these 10 seconds of event is another batch and then you explicitly define the dependencies between these batches and say i'm now going to take six of these 10 second batches and i'm going to make a minute batch out of them and then i'm going to do an average over five of these and, and so forth and that explicit dependency management is really the, the key difference between streaming and batch. Because once you have that, then you can, you can have these uh, forgiving environments and the data factories that, that automatically heal and so forth. But if you are in, in, the, in the streaming mode, then your dependencies are implicit. So they, you get different results depending on how two different streams are synchronized and match in time. So if you do click through uh, rate analysis, but for example, if one stream is late, you will get the different results from uh, when uh, both streams are on time. Whereas if you have the dependency management in place, the result is entirely predictable. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the key difference. Mm -hmm. Makes sense, thank you. So I also wanted to talk about uh, a bit about maturity levels and you briefly touched on them. Um, yeah, so maybe um, you can tell us a bit like what are the maturity level of uh, organization and when an organization is ready for data ops and what are the different level of uh, sort of readiness? So uh, ready for data ops is, uh, everybody's ready for data ops right now, just like everybody's ready for dev DevOps right now. There's, there's absolutely no drawback in, in adopting these things. Uh, we mentioned it in context to enablement and scaling before, but because data ops is sort of a necessity in order to scale efficiently. But you can, you, even if you have just one little data team doing all of the data things, you can have a, you can have a, a data ops way of, of working, definitely. Uh, regarding the maturity levels, I don't have a super great uh, defi definition of maturity levels. Um, there, there was an interesting development at, at uh, Spotify uh, because um, I, when I was at Google, if we trace back all to that time, we had a maturity ladder in terms of, of essentially of DevOps or or of uh, quality assurance and and, and software engineering, uh, and that ladder was called test certified, and that drove that was the main vehicle be, for transformation at Google from from uh, mostly manual testing to automated testing and and sort of part of the D DevOps uh, philosophy. And uh, that same idea was later applied at, at Spotify. I can only take a tiny little credit because I dumped a, a document on, on somebody's table, essentially. And, and then I left the company. And when I came back a few years later to, to look, people had these T-shirts that said test certified. So I affected not only the, the processes, but also the fashion. Um, and that was very successful at Spotify as well. And 
precisely what they needed. And they took that further to, to test certified for data, which essentially became a data ops maturity ladder. So instead of the original test certified with, with you know, you should have a continuous integration build and you should have uh, recovery measurements and you should add uh, regression test whenever you have a production bug and so forth. Uh, they added similar things for data. So you should have data quality measurements uh, that, uh, and you should have a schema management uh, automation so that you don't push out invalid or uh, so incompatible schema changes and, and so forth. So that is the only sort of data ops maturity ladder that I've seen. Uh, and also as a meta answer to that question, I would like to point people to a great company called Data Kitchen based in Boston, uh, where uh, the CEO, uh, Christopher Berg, is sort of the premier data ops prophet. Uh, so they have lots of good uh, resources online in blogs and presentations and, and uh, white papers and so forth. So you might be able to find further information there. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and probably, yeah, I will also, if you give me some links, I will put them in the description to the video. But uh, I remember we talked like when we were talking about self-service self and enabling analysts uh, to do self-service. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, you know, not all the organizations are ready and for some, like just uh, pairing a data analyst with uh, a data engineer will uh, you know, solve this, right? But then at some point, like, uh, um, I guess the company becomes mature enough when the, the, the pairing doesn't need to happen, right? So analysts can just use these tools to um, to do this themselves. So how do does a company go from, uh, you know, there is a central team who is taking care of all the ad hoc requests, like it was uh, in your case, to the, to the state where uh, analysts can themselves just go and, uh, you know, build these uh, ETLs themselves. Yeah, that, that's a long journey, uh, I'm uh -huh. afraid. And uh, the if, if you have the, the centralized data team uh, first, then the, the lower hanging fruit is to enable the developer teams in the organization. And that's the step that we took back in, back in 2013. Um, and the, the st sort of a step, uh, a later step is to, is to enable non-technical teams to, to uh, also sort of implement pipelines. But that's not necessarily a step that all organizations should mm -hmm. uh, take because it is much cheaper to embed analysts and software engineers or data engineers in the same team working towards the same goal rather than having this wall with a team that builds self-service capabilities and then on the other side of the wall you have these analysts that that's that's the waterfall uh, mentality still okay. sticking around okay. right uh, so in some organizations you cannot break down these barriers and mm -hmm. then it might uh, make sense mm -hmm. uh, but it's not necessarily a step that every organization should take. Mm -hmm. If you have the capability to mix up the competences, you're better off that way. It's much more efficient. Mm -hmm. so would you say it's more like an anti-pattern than... Uh, uh... In a sense, but some self-serves you, ha you have to do. So uh, if, if you look at uh, non-technical teams in a very data mature organization like Spotify, even the non-technical teams have access to like BigQuery and can do exploratory uh, uh, analytics there. And uh, I saw some numbers that I think it was 30% of the of this entire staff at Spotify use BigQuery on a regular basis, like a at least monthly basis. And that is an extraordinary figure. It's it's as low friction to get data to to uh, for your decisions at, at such a company as it is for us to, you know, open a, a word processor, right? It's it's the same. We don't think about it. We just do it. Uh, and very few companies are, are at that level of maturity. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, this reminds me that uh, actually at the beginning of our chat, I wanted to ask you this question about, uh, you know, different something, something ops. So we already talked, uh, I think, more or less about the difference between DevOps and data ops. And correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, like, uh, so in case of data ops, you have, uh, um, so the, the, the idea is uh, similar. So like all the principles, 
Um, but in addition, you have uh, you, you first you have embedded data engineers and data analysts in the in the team, right? Uh, this is a cross-functional team. And then you have this data platform, right? So the, which uh, has all these components that we talked. Is there something else uh, there that is like the key differentiator between data ops and uh, DevOps? No, I think you, I think you nail it. I mean, it's the uh, it's the different mix of competences, they, mm -hmm. the, but the, but the philosophies are very similar, and some activities are different, of course. Mm -hmm. but, but I think you nailed it. And yes, there are other ops. I think that's what you were about to get to, right? Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> there is ML ops, uh, right? So, do you have any ideas about it, and what is the difference between ML ops and data ops? Uh, it's it's also the different uh, mixes of people, right? Uh, so, if you, if if you have seen, I don't know if you've experienced like enterprise companies adopting data science and, and machine learning and so forth, but it, you usually see the water patterns showing up again. You see a bunch of data scientists in a corner and they are, first they have nothing to do and they are unhappy. And then mm -hmm. somebody figures out they need a pile of data. So to get the one, one off dump of data and then they build some models. And then what do we do now? Um, okay, those Python models are thrown over the wall to a bunch of developers mm -hmm. and they look at them and say, yuck. And, and translate them to Java, and then they, that that bunch of things is thrown over the wall to the operations people, uh, and then the uh, data scientists say, "We now have a new model," and uh, and then the, the whole thing repeats. Uh, but they never get any feedback from how they work in production and so forth. So, MLOps is essentially mixing uh, these different. Uh, competences, data science, data and software engineering, operations, and quality assurance into the same mix, and all working together, together towards the same goal with the same type of tools in the same environments and so forth, and closing that feedback loop from, from model idea to production mm -hmm. to measurement. And there's much overlap between data ops because all of the pipelines and the, the working in the data platform uh, and, and so on and so forth, and the data quality measurements and all of that is is in common, uh, but there are a few other things as well uh, that are specific to data science and machine learning models, like uh, you know running multiple models in parallel and, and trying out the new ones uh, in in sort of dry mode, uh, measuring internal uh, characteristics of of the models, the you know measuring precision and recall, for example, in, in real life, and acting on that, and having ensemble models where you combine several. So there are a number. Of of, of sort of ML specific things mm -hmm. that uh, that uh, come into play here, okay. but, but the philosophies uh, are the same. Okay. And then, yeah, because I often see teams that have both ML engineers and data engineers and analysts and data scientists all work together. And uh, then now the question is, is it like, is it ML ops? Is it data ops? Or like, maybe it doesn't really matter. Like, as long as team is, uh, you know, working on uh, delivering value and. Uh, Exactly. <laughs> okay. It's oh, the alignment. Uh, sorry. It's the it's the alignment towards the, the same goal, right? And mm -hmm. I think if we fast forward five, ten years, we will see the DevSecOps coming mm -hmm. becoming more mature, where where security is aligned towards the same goal, and you know the data compliance ops, where where mm -hmm. the legal uh, aspects also are aligned, uh, instead of, of of having another department that says no to things. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so now recently, and I found out about this thing called data mesh only maybe uh, one month ago. But since I accidentally discovered it, <laughs> it, I noticed that it's all over the place. Like everyone seems to be talking about this. So what is data mesh and how is yeah, it yeah. related to data ops or? Uh, yeah, it is related. It's everybody's talking about it. Very few have seen one. I, I, I actually have seen one because uh, Spotify uh, again moved to one essentially uh, when we moved from Hadoop to the cloud uh, as, a, as a side effect of the cloud move. And data mesh, first, it it assumes data ops are in place. Otherwise, you can, it's not meaningful to have a data mesh. It also assumes something called data democratization, which we uh, have touched on but not named, which is the enablement of, of others, all teams, to to uh, uh, to use to access the data and to implement data pipelines. Uh, and data mesh is a scaling technology 
that is relevant for large organizations that where the centralization of how you work with the data, the, the technology of the data platform and the storage of the data platform and so forth, where it has it becomes a bottleneck that the that the data platform is homogeneous and is like governed in a centralized way. Usually you you have this it used to be Hadoop, nowadays it's the cloud where the data platform, all of the data files are of the same format and they're governed with the same workflow orchestration and the, and, and the same principles for, for privacy access and so forth. Um, data mesh is about decentralizing that governance. So, uh, so after the after Spotify's moved to data mesh, rather than going to the the central Hadoop cluster, you went to the people, the teams that actually were producing a particular data set, whether if it was the user team or, or the or the web team or or whatever, and you talk to them to get access to the data, rather than going to talking to some some data infrastructure teams. There is also an aspect of. Uh, um, responsibility on the source system owners, the, the user team and the web team and so forth, to produce data artifacts into the data platform. So uh, in, in early data platforms, it's often the case that, hey, I need this, I need this data. Uh, could you export it for me? And, and the owning team says, no, we have more important things to do, but here you can get access to the database and you do the dump yourselves. So, uh, please do it during, during the night when the, when the activity mm -hmm. is low, right? Uh, so with, uh, with time, with maturity, that shift, that responsibility shifts to the, to the source system owners to uh, do that export uh, on their own and, and, and be sort of having that as part of their uh, expect, expectations. I am quite concerned uh, regarding the uh, the talk of the, the buzz of the, around the data mesh because I think that uh, there's so many companies that jump on the latest buzzword mm -hmm. and say, oh, we want that as well. And if you don't have a strong governance or strong culture of sharing in place, if you go rather go directly to data mesh instead of via a centralized platform where you share everything, then you will end up with the data spread around in silos, which is what we used to have before there were data mm -hmm. platforms, right? So we're back into the, to the everything is locked up in microservices. Um, and uh, you, will have, you won't have the homogeneity that, that keeps the operations low and, the, and, the keep, and, and enables the data democratization and so forth. And if you, uh, and if you say to teams, hey, you are expected to, uh, to uh, export this data set. Yes, but the data mesh philosophy over here, it says mm -hmm. that we should also be responsible for curating that and cleaning that data set. And uh, first of all, you have to wait the quarter until we have more time. And second of all, uh, we will export the cleaning things, but in that cleaning, lots of information is lost. And that whether, that's in, whether the lost information is important or not depends on the use case. So for reporting purposes, you want everything to be clean and smooth and all the real users uh, are included. But for fraud detection purposes or, or bot detection purposes, you want all of the dirty information. So uh, and the, in in the data lake, everything raw is dumped, right? So all the information is there. But but in in with data silos, all of the raw, interesting information is is sort of hidden away. So I'm I'm quite concerned that the, all of the buzz around this will make people mm -hmm. never get out of their data silos. Yeah. So as I understood, just to quickly summarize, so like. Uh, uh, organization involves, then there is a central uh, data platform, but at some point it just becomes too big, right? And then uh, the idea behind behind data mesh is uh, we start chopping this data platform into different uh, sort of sub platforms or even separate, completely separate platforms. And then this is the, in essence the what data mesh is about, right? Something like that, yes. Yeah.
Okay. Uh, and it, the time at which it makes sense to split up the, the homogeneous or the centralized platform depends on your capability to coordinate. If you have a strong autonomous culture like, like Spotify, then it makes sense at some size. But Spotify managed to become, I don't know, several thousand employees before before you had that were at that scale and but if you have a, a company that with very strong capabilities of coordinating your work like google and facebook have for example uh then the, the centralized solutions work mm -hmm. to perhaps to infinite scale um, okay thank you uh we still have three uh, more questions and i want to ask you if you have uh, some time uh, Absolutely, okay. my time is yours. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, the first one is um, how do you keep track of all the transformations that have been undertaken between each newly create, created data set within the data platform? Yeah, that's a very good question, and and I uh, I sort of skipped uh, past that, uh, and and the answer is simple: it's all code, right? So we don't keep track of data; we only keep track of code. And part of that co code is the workflow definitions, which says that these data sets over here, when they arrive, are supposed to be transformed to this data set over there. So they, the, uh, all of the definitions are uh, thereby in code. And uh, the data sets can get orphaned if you change the code without changing the data. So you have to have some Light, very lightweight process for that, like an automated retention or, or something. But every single data set that is produced and active somewhere is defined in code at some point. So uh, there is also tools uh, to sort of, if you don't have sufficient order to sort of recover from that order, th there are the cataloging tools that will go out and scout your, your uh, Google Cloud storage or S3 storage or databases and so forth. Um, in a way, those are useful, but those are also to patch a symptom when you perhaps should address the, the root course instead. So I tend to not use these tools so, so heavily, but in some cases they might be applicable. But, but the, the, the short answer is you keep track of everything in, in code. Yeah, thank you. Can you name some uh, relational database that make uh, immutable snapshots, uh, for example, data sets, and then run version transformations with the ability to differentiate between the versions? Uh, I cannot, uh, but I know remarkably little about relational databases, <laughs> and I'm terrible at SQL. <laughs> so, so uh, I don't. So what we do in, in data platforms uh, typically is to dump the database tables that we're interested in. So, so we take a full dump each day or each hour or something. And, uh, and that avoids, for example, the, uh, this problem with slowly changing dimensions that, that you have in data warehouses because we have the full history way back in time. And um, that introduces some other problems, uh, for example, with GDPR compliance. That, so you need to prepare for that. Uh, but uh, but that's that's generally how we handle the sort of the different versions of database tables. That you lose some information in that dumping because what happened in between you don't catch. So there are ways to to uh, mitigate that or to get all of the information and. Uh, one way is to have the application dump all of the sort of change events, uh, either on a stream or in a change table inside the database or via something called change data capture, which is essentially a way of translating the transaction log in the, in the database to, to like a Kafka screen. And then you get all of the nitty gritty details if you want. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then the last question we have from uh, Alec is, uh... Mm. I don't know what lake house means, but like, how would you define lake house architecture, and what's the core difference be, uh, compared to data warehouse? Yes, so um, uh, data warehouse is the predates the data lake, and and that that is a, a construct for 
collecting aggregated data from from various systems uh, to a place where you where you can build reports and do exploratory analytics and so forth. The data warehouses usually don't have the raw data, but they have the aggregated data, and they tend to might very well have mutable tables and so forth. The a data lake has all of the raw data, and then you have these functional uh, transforms. A data lake house is a combination of these two where you they technically look like a data lake but you add the ability to uh, interactively explore your data with within and add indexing and so forth um, to to uh, to be able to use it as a data warehouse and then also add mutability to to the data sets which means that you can reuse your ETL scripts from the data warehouse without changing the transformations. But you lose, you break these functional principles that make the data lake and the data platform so efficient for operations and innovation. Uh, so uh, yes, it's, it's, yes, it can be useful as, as a gateway drug, uh, as I said, if, if you want to transition, uh, but I I think it's an anti-pattern. I so I recommend I strongly recommend people to to get into immutability instead. Just like we nowadays accept that a contain or a container image is is of course immutable. It's something that we build from the source code in a purely functional manner. I mean, if you say that no way, we sh I think we should revise that immutability and start patching our containers in production. You know, people will <laughs> throw axes at you, right? It's it's insane because it will it increases this complexity so massively, right? So stick to mut immutability and and bear, live with the great fruits of of functional transformations. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much. And you have covered all the questions we have. I still have a lot more that I didn't manage to ask, but maybe we can keep them for some other day. So thanks a lot for joining us today and sharing your experience, your knowledge, and uh, defining all these terms. Uh, some of them were just buzzwords to me previously, like this data mesh. Now I know. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, I think uh, that's all. Do you have any last words? Uh, I do not. Uh, if you uh, were interested in some of the topics that I brought up, there there is a uh, there is also a list of the conference presentations uh, that I've done uh, on if you go to skling.com uh, next to the reading list. Uh, so you will find me diving into things like the data ops and the quality assurance for data pipelines and. Um, how to solve GDPR related problems uh, and uh, and then solving some of the time related problems that we're speaking that we've been spoken of uh, for example how do you deal with late incoming data and so forth so if you I want to dive further sure, that's yes. a resource yes I will make sure to, to include that uh, as well and here on Twitter LinkedIn uh, data talks club somewhere else <laughs> Yeah, okay. So I guess that's uh, all. And uh, a lot of people are saying thank you. And I join them in thanking you. Uh, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, have a nice weekend. It was a pleasure to be here.